Thanks for tuning in to the Replatform podcast with myself, James Gerd, and my co-host, Paul Rogers. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm a bit tired after uh, a couple of trips back to back, but uh, yeah, getting there. Um, yeah, how are you doing? You got to stop this international man of mystery travel thing, mate. Um, just lock yourself away in rural Ascot like I do, and then you'll be uh, a lot calmer. One more, and then I'm done for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you always say. Um, look, thanks for, for everyone for, for tuning in again. And if you're new to the podcast, we hope you enjoy it. We'd love for you to subscribe. You get new um, alerts. We drop an episode every week. And um, we'd love a like on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, etc. Uh, if you enjoy the content. So our topic today is another important one for e-commerce teams. It's creating, managing and using an e-commerce roadmap. What we're going to cover is what's a roadmap, how you, how you can approach a roadmap, um, you know, how you resource it, what goes into it, what it, what a good roadmap includes, tips for effective planning, and what are the e-com teams that we work with in focus on what's really popular in roadmaps at the moment. Um, so with no further ado, let's crack on and get into the first um, question. I'm just going to summarise, for anyone who's new to this, might be new into e-commerce teams or hasn't run a roadmap before, what we basically mean is a plan, a schedule of work for the maintenance and continuous improvement of your website, which is essentially the e-commerce team's equivalent of a content calendar. It's showing your priorities, your work streams, and it's really designed to help you get, uh, help you plan effectively, but also to show internal, external partners what's coming up, what might impact them, and what might they need to provision some resources for. So, with that in mind, how do you approach a roadmap, Paul? What, what's your, what have you seen, and what is your advice to people for approaching it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think overall, the way that we would usually want to do it is uh, we'd probably take as much context as we could from a client um, and maybe they've got kind of an existing development backlog and a few things that different stakeholders want to do. And then we'd want to do some level of like audit, like whether that's us, someone else, number of third parties, et cetera, um, to basically pull out like a big list of items um, along with their priority and then kind of map out um, where they should sit. And then we'd usually want to put it into kind of short term, that kind of like backlog piece, which is like bugs, issues, any quick wins, anything that's kind of directly impacting trade compliance everything else um, and then you'd have your medium term kind of new features and maybe like customer experience improvements and then longer term like kind of material projects and more like kind of innovation areas um, that's kind of how we'd want to usually want to do it yeah i think that makes sense i i've typically split it out into into three bits so the first bit is the yeah enhancements and and the day-to-day trading bit, we need to, you know, we need to uh, get a new promotion type set up to support the trading team. Um, we need to um, enhance a feature we've already implemented that we agreed um, would have a phase two. Things that, that are going to be, you know, one to two, maybe just a few days worth of resources that come out of your retainer that you have the agency. Then the major projects, as you were saying, and this that, this is one that's critical. And I, I think people underestimate this, the need to plan for this and get people um, to do discovery on a major project. A good example is a business change, it's ERP, it impacts all areas of the business. E-commerce needs to understand what's happening, what changes to the data flows there are, are there any operational processes, are there any new data, um, uh, 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 you know, any new API calls that need to be made so that the development team can plan it and plan the resource on top of your retainer. Because if you don't tell them and you throw it at the last minute, you often find that your retain service, your day-to-day work is put under pressure because they, they don't have the bandwidth to react so quickly. But the third one is, is, the, is the bug fixes. And I know a lot of people don't consider this roadmap, but for me it is because it's resource planning. And I've seen too many times when people don't think about it and they just assume the bugs are going to be fixed. Um, but what is your priority for bugs? Which one's the most important to the business? What can you live with? Because it's so, you know, it's like a P3. It's not impacting trading or customers and you kick it down the line until you've got that extra resource. I think that I think that's the one bit I've seen in terms of robot management where people underestimate the the importance of doing it at a bug fixing level um, and also communicating that back out to their internal team. So if somebody in a trading team is expecting a a fix on a bug, but you've agreed with the the, the, the sponsor or the e-com lead to deprioritize it because there's higher impact things that need to be resolved. Do they know about it? Um, so yeah, uh, I I think those are those. I think that makes perfect sense. And basically, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the other thing with including the smaller items as well is it kind of helps for them when you're depend like and obviously there's different ways to uh, work with your development team or agency, and we'll come on to that. Um, but when you're kind of planning priorities and kind of you know filling allocation essentially, um, quite often you'll need or there'll be an opportunity to include quite a lot of those smaller ones, and then maybe like some of the middle or kind of medium term ones, dependent on like the ticket sizes and kind of estimates. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's kind of um, having that all in one place so that you can see all of that together. Yeah, and I think this is a really important point for people it, it, is that um, the, the, this is the roadmap's a fluid thing. It's not a fixed as we have a roadmap, it's going to be implemented because what often happens in sprints is an item that maybe was provisioned for 10 hours of resource, they come up with a the complexity, they report back and say, look, it's going to take 12 to 14 hours now. That might push one of the items you had one of the tickets in your sprint down into the next sprint. That could be a bug or it could be a minor enhancement. And now your roadmap has changed from sprint to sprint. And that needs to be communicated back to the stakeholders impacted by that change. So it's really, really important to understand that this is a dynamic beast. It's not a do it once and and off you go and everything works happily and smoothly ever after. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So on the you, you mentioned an audit. What so for people listening, what for you is an audit? What are you auditing? I think, I think it depends really because it could end up being a series of audits or like I guess I'm thinking about it from the type of client we would work with which is kind of like medium-sized business where like you might go and do an audit of kind of you know the front end like all of their kind of you know end-to-end customer experience considerations like everything and then you might pull out along with the client kind of what the priorities are and then start to kind of map that out against either you know if you've got sprints or retainer months or whatever else based on priorities but I think equally it could be that you know you've done an SEO audit at some point and you might have someone do like more of a CRO or kind of UX focused audit and then and potentially kind of something more focused on like international or you know back office systems like you said like I guess I guess it it depends really but it's just like the way that or the types of businesses we typically work with it would more be like just a view on as much context as we can get and then our view on kind of like where the business is in different areas and then starting to pull things out and prioritize them um, but yeah it could well be a series of audits I guess okay yeah that makes sense um so what so we've talked about the types of work and that we the three key types in terms of like ongoing work major projects uh, bugs fixes etc how how should people prioritize this for me is a, is a really important question because you've got i think timeline and, and prioritization are two critical capabilities for managing a roadmap. so what is your advice how do you help clients know what to prioritize and what criteria do you see clients using to prioritize what's in a roadmap yeah absolutely. so i think it, i mean it does differ dependent on uh like i think every client's different aren't they and like a lot of it depends on the different stakeholders and there's so many variables around kind of like how long people have been you know waiting for different things and like you know it might be that there's a new product launch that requires a, a load of new functionality or yeah there's obviously loads of variables but i think ideally you'd be prioritizing based on like commercial impact and um you know new revenue from new or existing customers um but equally quite often there's like a brand influence on that as well and like you know as a creative director that's like you know obsessed with a new template or improving the size of product photography or yeah and you know quite often it could equally be more from the e-com team where it's an obsession with performance or mobile usability or whatever else but I think in an ideal world you'd be at least largely uh, focusing on revenue and you know all of the transactional um, aspects. Yes, yeah, so if only the brand I mentioned didn't sometimes hijack that focus on, on e-commerce metrics but it's, that's an important point because yeah, there are businesses where brand is as important to them as the pure numbers. And you can't lose sight of that because you alienate key stakeholders if you deliver a roadmap that that isn't um, you know, tackling some of the projects that they think is important for elevating the brand, presenting the brand online visually, content-wise. So the, the, I think the, the most important thing I've learned over the years is prioritization criteria need to be defined. Now that doesn't you can change them if you decide they're not working. But if you have no understanding of how you are prioritising, it becomes really ambiguous. And it also becomes just quite an, an emotive thing of, well, this is more important to me, therefore it should be top. And then someone else saying, but it's not because of this 
this reason, it, uh, you know, I think this other task is more important. So being able to, and it might be a blend where revenue is one, customer experience is another, uh, you know, brand executions, are, but but just to find them. So I've done it with a few clients where we've we've had like three criteria. And for example, one will be revenue potential. And we have a rating system of naught to five behind it, which defines the the scale of it. Um, you know, and that scale is dependent on the size of the business. If you're a million pound business, the you know ten thousand to fifty thousand pounds worth of incremental revenue is sizable. If you're a hundred million pound business, all of a sudden that's negligible. So. Um, I, I think that analogy enables you to then look at if, is there a business case to the the item on the roadmap that somebody wants to push forward? Does it tackle um, the criteria and does it warrant um, whoever's managing the roadmap to say, well, actually, I think we need to bump this one back up. Um, so that's really important, having clear criteria so you can take some of the emotional elements out of disagreements. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only other thing, I think it's like you what ideally want to balance that kind of value to the business and then the um, complexity for either your team or the development team because that's the only other thing is like the amount of time and the proportion of either your internal time or development time um, it then takes up so it's kind of balancing it so that you're progressing um, as fast as you can on either of those two yeah that's a really good point actually for uh, for anyone who hasn't done this before is it's understanding what the true impact in terms of because resource will be required potentially across different stakeholder groups from developers to marketing agencies to internal stakeholders and one group might perceive something as low effort and for the other group it's high effort um, and being very transparent with people about the reasons for why an item might not be able to deliver in the next sprint and it might be you know three sprints time when it gets completed um, and that's why I think visualizations are quite useful for this so where you have I guess it depends how much you communicate, but where you have a a just even in Excel, just like a real simple Gantt chart, which shows the amount of time and effort that's needed to get something over the line um, and being able to play that back visually to people to show them that, hey, look, your work is is planned in, but it requires a lot of development effort that you don't you haven't understood. And therefore, that's why it's not going to happen for the next you know, two to four weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. What about tips for managing a roadmap? Um, what, yeah, how would you advise client teams to manage their roadmap so that it's effective and things don't become disorganized? Yeah, so I think you've already touched on, I think anything from my perspective, I think anything kind of visual and um, kind of uh, intuitive uh, makes it a bit easier. So a lot of people are using Miro at the moment or um, the other one that's similar to Miro, I've forgotten what it's called. Um, we typically tend to use Asana and we'll have kind of a board built out based on either the priorities or department or timelines dependent on how clients want to run it. But yeah, I just like anything that's kind of drag and droppable where you can add a bit more detail. Um, yeah, and then you can kind of show progress. I think like, yeah, visual and kind of yeah very easy for anyone to pick up and kind of see detail beyond just the initial kind of overview i think that's that's how i would look that's how i'd look to do it yeah i think you're right for for the for people outside the e-com team in, internal stakeholder communication visual all the way not lots of detailed reports and, and you know they don't need to see detail like burn down charts from sprints out of you know um project management tools I really like, um, as you say with Asana, I've used um, various like Trello I've used before. I've used the equivalent in tools like ClickUp where you have a Kanban system of, of, um, of, of almost like post-its where you have um, you know new item evaluated by agency, um, prioritised P1, P2, P3, um, booked into Sprint, in Sprint, on UAT and and following it through, you can use those in so many different ways for roadmap management. And they're a great way of being able to visually progress stuff and, as you say, drag and drop and move it because you might have an item that you prioritise and it's and you've said to a, a partner, we want it in the next sprint, and then all of a sudden something changes internally and you can quickly drag that out and send a notification and basically update the partner and say, hey, look, we, we don't want to drop that ticket now. We now need to swap out. Um, the other thing I think is really good for... And for the bit of the uh, e-commerce team and their the business they're working in, so not external people, is being able to show progress because I think other businesses, other parts of the business who aren't involved in the day-to-day management of a roadmap in terms of you know what the new tickets, how are the tickets doing, what progress are made, can sometimes see things moving very slowly and get a bit disheartened of why are we not getting work turned around quicker. So ability to show things like 
number of number of tickets in progress, number of tickets completed, completed versus outstanding, um, showing visual reports of percentage of um of uh, roadmap items in progress complete is a really nice way of showing people progress week on week and even showing things like you know we've added 40 new tasks and of these 20 are now in progress anything you can do that demonstrates progress helps to keep people on side and avoids those horrible internal bits we will moan about the e-commerce team because they haven't delivered the work that the, the you know customer service are waiting on or the trading team are waiting on yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that Asana has done recently that's pretty good for some of that stuff is um, they almost like automate some of the, like um, you can do like a weekly update or a monthly update. And if you add like the right parameters within the ticket, um, you can even show things like where you've removed dependencies and like all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, all of that stuff I think is um, is really valuable for that as well. Yeah, exactly. And I guess linked into to talking about sharing information and making making progress and, and priorities transparent is is the also communicating and making sure that as an e-commerce team you are talking to the right counterparts in the business to understand what their roadmap is. And this is a really important skill set. It's it's that uh, cross-functional collaboration piece of um, you know, regular meetups to go, okay, what 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 in your roadmap is changing? Have you got any new priority projects? Is there anything that's going to have a dependency on e-commerce? Do we need to provision resource? Will you need development work from us? Um, and equally sharing back from an e-commerce point of view, what might be changing your roadmap? Anything new that's coming down in your pipeline that might have an impact on their area of the business? Um, you know, this can be down to, to things like changing a live chat tool and making sure that the customer service team that are using it are aware of it. They know when it's going live and they've got time to prep in internal um, training and briefing to be ready to use it in anger. What is Ampliance? In a word, it's freedom. The freedom to build a digital experience as limitless as your vision. Create, preview, schedule and manage all your content in one easy place. Find out more at Ampliance.com. Ampliance. Experience freedom. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think actually like with roadmap, I think comms is like we always talk about how important comms is and like it makes a replatform project. But I actually think it's just as important in roadmap because there's more room for people to get frustrated. Like there's so many clients that we work with where you've got like the marketing team and the brand team and like all the other stakeholders, to be honest, like even like the ops team and buying team, like waiting for stuff to be delivered on a roadmap. And you have to like, you have to keep them informed on like what you're working on and why. Um, and you have to almost like justify why something's being prioritized over yeah. some of that stuff. Um, and, you know, certain expectations and everything else, because it is almost as equally political as a replatform mm. project can be. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, the being the harbinger of bad news when you have to tell uh, a senior stakeholder that their item that they thought was getting delivered in the next two weeks is now being shunted down the line. Yeah, and you have you. This, this is why knowing what your prioritisation criteria are and being all, uh, in control of your roadmap is so important because at least you then have some evidence or you have a tangible explanation rather than oh yeah, sorry, yours is going to be delayed by four weeks and then people look at you saying why. Um, you have to manage them. Um, how? So my, my normal way of doing this from a communication point of view is the e-commerce team with their agency partner who's doing, well, assuming they have a development agency, which most businesses do rather than internal development, but regardless, whoever that development um, function is, weekly calls to do progress, issues, priorities, um, review and actions, and then using um, uh, like daily stand-ups as and when required, but you don't have to have them all the time. I think the cadence of those becomes more important when you're in big project delivery rather than just day-to-day -day, um, you know, roadmap management. Well, what do you normally advise people to do to, to, to keep the communication tidy in terms of frequency? I think um, weekly call is usually what we would try and recommend um so weekly call with uh between the agency and the client and then like quite often we're a part of this um so it'd be between us and the client as well if we're managing the agency um the only other thing that i've been that i that we do now that i think is important is just make sure that there's a weekly update that's written down um purely so that can be kind of forwarded up the chain um and you know like internal uh stakeholders can um you know 
uh, just forward that onto their buses and like add some kind of commentary, et cetera. Um, but I think that's important as well. And then I think usually one thing that I've always really liked, and I stole this actually from, um, I used to work at the Comran shop and they did a quarterly strategy day where they'd get all of their internal and external um, stakeholders in a room and they would essentially talk about what they did the previous quarter and what they wanted to do the following quarter. And um, because it was like almost mini presentation format, there was like a level of accountability because everyone was in a room and then there was also room for everyone to kind of like collaborate and everything else and the development agency would be there to like listen and get more context around what should be prioritized um and i think that's a really nice way of handling comms getting people bought in um and then also kind of like understanding more cross department so yeah i think that's always quite a good exercise yeah 100 percent agree with that um regular briefings uh, and, uh, and to do the what's coming, but also what might be changing. Like I had, and especially, as you said, with the external, I, I work with a couple of clients who this year, they've slightly changed their their kind of, their, the, the I guess, the, the aggression with which they are pushing forward developments because there's a nervousness around the economy and knowing where it's going and what level of growth you're going to get this year. Will, will growth plateau? Is there going to be some categories have had a dip in the last 12 months? Um, being being really transparent to say to people, you know, we talked about we were going to carry on with our planned growth rate. Actually, that's not happening now. We need to align resource wise. There's nothing worse for an agency than having an expectation of ramping up and provisioning for that, and then realizing that they don't need to because there's there's a cost and, and an opportunity cost to to that business. And I think that aligns my my last point on this on managing roadmaps is the e-commerce lead who is the uh, liaison with the agencies has got to stay on top of their PMs and uh, uh, project managers and account managers. Um, You know, you've you've got to have a strong relationship, but you've got to also hold hold them to task if they're not on top of the roadmap. They should know your priorities if you're communicating uh, effectively. They should be managed on your behalf with their development teams to make sure people are focused on the right tickets um, and the last thing you want, and I have seen this on several occasions when it's when the communication uh, on this level isn't thought about, is AMs are off doing something and it's not fully aligned with what the e-commerce team wants. So you've got to you've got to make sure you use those weekly calls effectively to check that they are still aligned and they're pushing on the right thing. And if things are slipping, that's when your escalation comes in to, to push back and go, okay, this isn't acceptable. Sometimes you can accept a bit of delay, but on your top priority, you've really got to be on top of it with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's move on to to um, to our last discussion point for today, which is what are some of the most common areas people are looking at at the moment in e-commerce in terms of what they're putting into roadmaps? Yeah, absolutely. So we've obviously built um, a list uh, here. So I think there's, there's just there's always so many, but it does feel like there's a bit of a trend at the moment, I guess. A lot of our clients are brands trying to like strengthen their DTC proposition over their wholesale uh, competitors. And for at the minute, it feels like things like bundling, like bundle builders, um, you know, com- like com- uh, configurators, like that whole kind of build, like customized product piece. Uh, 360s and AR, um, loyalty is a big one that's quite... Um, uh, that's coming up more and more and like more complex loyalty as well. So it's actually, I'd say more kind of VIP than loyalty, but it feels like people are trying to do a lot more with that and they're trying to be a lot more sophisticated, um, which is good. And then the Shopify world, because of 2.0, there's a lot of theme rebuilds flying around, a lot of people planning that. And I think, um, and then I've left some that you've uh, talked about that we can come on to, but I think the other thing that's quite interesting at the moment with the way people are managing their rebuilds so you've put re-platform in here and I'm kind of like digging into that or like kind of eating into your point Um, and then I've put the theme rebuild which is comes as a result of the 2.0 kind of piece that you'd need to do with Shopify and I think a lot of people at the moment are rolling everything up into CapEx projects um, and then trying to because I think it can be more efficient in terms of like internal resource and also um, budget as well I think that's quite an efficient way of working it feels like a lot of people at the moment are kind of you know taking some big chunky bits putting it into one project and then basically treating it as you know you as you would have a replatforming project or it could be that it is a project and then you're pushing loads of other features into it yeah it's interesting because because of the nature of the work i do which is a blend of e-commerce strategy and replatforming consultancy um 
during during lockdown from 2020 to early 21 it was relatively quiet and replatforming i think people were just so frantic with e- with growth and servicing customers getting the stock in because of all the supply chain issues they've come out of that and a lot of businesses realize that their their technology wasn't fit for purpose process inefficiencies integration is not so effective data flows not as automated as they want to be and a lot of now focused um resource and priorities on replatforming and this is either upgrading on existing ones i've had people go from like older installations of magento to the new installation um or it's moving away to a a more modern tech stack um you know api driven um uh, um or moving to one of the modern um SaaS platforms like a shopify or big commerce to give them that greater flexibility so that's really interesting to see i guess it lines with what you're saying so i'm seeing a few people prioritizing their spend in that area to get themselves ready for the for future growth but the other one that's been interesting for me as well as people being a bit more pragmatic about um resource um prioritization so i've seen uh, a few consolidating storefronts where they previously had loads of international storefronts but actually the level of personalization might not be where they want it to be. They're not fully translated or the revenue um, that's going through them doesn't justify the cost and effort of continued full translation. They don't, they can't service it, you know, at a local level because the, the revenue doesn't justify building out the team. And actually it made more sense to simplify it into a single storefront with multi-currency and have it in English and just focus on delivering a really good customer experience and a fast working storefront um, and ship it internationally, but not worry about localizing it and come back to that two, three years down the line if the revenue growth in that market is there. You know, and other other companies still who've decided not to sell into Europe because of the added costs and complexities around um, shipping into EU and have pulled back and therefore focused more of their effort into UK storefronts. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that a little bit as well. And I think um, about three years ago, it feels like everyone just went and just randomly localized uh, parts of their site, or there was definitely like a lot of growth in that. And um, yeah, we've had two or three clients that have like reverse localized um, over the last uh, kind of 12 months, um, particularly if I think like, you know, they might have like an Italian market that's actually like 0.3% of their online revenues, but you know, it takes loads of time for teams to, um, yeah, kind of manage some aspects of that. But yeah, it's an interesting trend. Yeah, it's in the. I guess that some of the you're working on 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 um, a different set of projects than I am. You're talking about the subscriptions, um, the bundles, and the builders. Some of the ones I'm seeing some of my clients working on more is around improving core navigational structures. So they they've noticed that basically they're not aligned with the shopper decision tree and the shopper. They're very much aligned with their own internal categorization of product and how the business thinks about product rather than how do customers shop for it. So looking at better navigation journeys, I you know, haven't done a project with an equestrian brand where we spent a lot of time thinking about the customer experience and what is in people's mindsets from um, you know professional riders through to to casual hobbyists through to people buying as presents for you know grandkids and the different shop buy journeys and the sub levels that sit behind below that and the types of information and content and the visualization of it and then how to make that user friendly and fit for user interaction across devices and how to make it SEO optimized as well to benefit from an internal linking. So I've seen about uh, two or three of my clients have gone down that route of improving their core menu navigation and and like filtering as well on PLPs, which has been quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. I think um, for whatever reason, like a lot of our clients are just like obsessed with more like engagement features at the moment yeah. and like, so more kind of like D2C oriented things. Um, but yeah, I think all of these, like, you know, there's so many more out there that people are, are trying to get done. And I think the other thing is like about now, all of the focus changes to like peak trade in any way and like trying to get maybe they've got, you know, two months left to try and get some features rolled out or some things improved. Yeah. Um, but no, that all. Uh, I think I agree with all that. So let's wrap this up in a convenient uh, main takeaway. So, what would be your main takeaway about um, how you how you um, run a roadmap effectively? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the one thing that I mentioned there that I do still think is really good is I think people, you know, quite often people have like small development retainers and they'll be trying to get everything in and then, you know, you run out of time and then things will get delayed and, you know, like you'll test something and then it will need to go back and it will need more work and that will then push it into another month. Um, I actually quite like 
the concept of rolling things up and doing a single release be that you know you do a sprint quarterly or, or however it ends up um or just like you know a big capex budget and then go back to the retainer i just think that's i think there's more efficient ways of working quite often i i definitely agree with that and i've seen that on a couple of my clients where inevitably new stuff comes in so quickly like businesses are, are constantly changing all the time and trying to remain competitive and they forget some of the old stuff and it and you end up with these tasks that's why one of my metrics for roadmap management which i recommend to anyone is um uh is the time since created the task was created um for tasks that aren't completed and then looking at um, those in time zones from those that are less less than 14 days 14 to 28 days 28 days plus and if you start seeing loads and loads of tasks hitting 28 days plus it suggests that you're not doing very well at managing your roadmap you're letting you're letting it's the equivalent of technical debt basically you're letting the deadwood in so i'm with you on that if if it's going to be kicked down for six months it shouldn't be in your roadmap Take, take it out of the roadmap, have it in a like a, a list somewhere to come back to if you want to. But if it's going to be kicked kicking the can for six months, you can argue that it's not important enough. Or if the business really does need it, you're right. I think that's a really nice way of doing it. Package it up as a project, put a number on it, um, and the business either says, yes, we're willing to spend it, or you just can it and delete those tasks. Yeah, yeah so nice, nice advice. My one is... Mine's on the uh, on the uh, non exciting um, um, managing of it because um, I'm exceptionally dull, and it's about basically realizing that roadmaps have to evolve; they're not static. Don't panic about changing it, but make sure that the e commerce owner of the roadmap in your business maintains good relationship with the other department leads in your business and the external partners that impact by this, like development agencies and digital marketing agencies, so that when there is a change, they communicate it upwards and outwards and that the other people impacted can react and can also feedback if they've got any concerns or issues so you manage it instead of getting further down the line where a potential issue becomes a massive risk. Um, so that so hopefully that's been an interesting uh, and insightful run through of e-commerce roadmaps, what they are, how to manage them, what other people are looking at at the moment. Um, if you've got any questions, do reach out to us via social media, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and thanks for listening. We do appreciate it. Keep an ear out for the next episode. That we'll drop them every Tuesday. Do subscribe. And we would love that rating on Apple, Spotify or YouTube. Thank you very much. For more information on this topic, head over to replatform.fm for our audio podcasts. To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.